Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is round five from the 2014 Sinkfield Cup between Hikaru Nakamura playing on the white side and Fabiano Caruana. Going into this round, Nakamura has one and a half points from the first four rounds and Caruana has a perfect four for four, really having an absolutely fantastic tournament up to this point. So let's see what took place in this fifth round game. Nakamura again on the white side, opening with d4. Caruana replying d5. c4, c6, the slob defense. Both king knights come out. Knight b to d2, the briar variation. And now bishop f5. Getting the bishop outside of the pawn chain, but it's now a bishop that's accessible to a knight. White looks to pick up the bishop pair. Black's not so quick to allow the knight that's on the edge to take the bishop. First playing to e4. This knight could take him out, but black would then recapture and improve the position of the king knight, and white will also have to waste a little bit of time before this knight is back into play. So white gives the bishop a kick, f3, and only then does the bishop drop back to g6. This is coming at some cost. Uh, with f3, you weaken both diagonal and second rank. But okay, e3, e6, and now g3. Initially, I thought g3 was there to defend the knight, and maybe in some lines that's important because of a knight move with the discovered attack against the knight. I, however, believe that white is always in a good position to simply reply with knight takes bishop. You might also think that g3 is there to fiend cut of the bishop, but... I don't think that that is the case. I think g3 is primarily aimed at um, not allowing any potential pressure against h2 at some point. After this capture and the recapture, the rook is the black rook is brought right to life, hitting at h2. It's defended once, it's attacked once, it's unprotected, and there could be ensuing attacks with the bishop or the queen. g3 would interfere with diagonal pressure against the h2 pawn. So, okay. Following up, bishop e7, and now a3. a3, I believe, is a waiting move. Waiting for what exactly? Waiting for the queen knight to commit itself to d7, prior to capturing on d5. You'll notice on this move 9, if white takes, black's going to take with the c pawn, keeping a balance in the center, 2 to 2 majority, or not 2 to 2 majority, 2 to 2 ratio, and c6 is now vacated, so knight c6 is going to be a great home for the queen knight. a3 waits for the queen knight to commit, and a3 may even, looking a bit deeper, set up some idea of c5, and then there's b4 securing the c5 point. Okay, we don't go down that road. We never quite get to see this type of shift structurally, but nevertheless, I believe it's a3. Well, a3 is a move that is simply waiting. Okay, black does commit. Knight b to d7. White now captures. Black recaptures with the c pun, maintaining the ratio in the center. If you're capturing like this, it's now a 2 to 1, and at some point, this majority can maybe be set into motion. On top of that, with this pawn capturing in this direction, f5 is a bit less secure. I've seen ideas of bishop h3 and the knight jumping into f5. But okay, in this game it's c takes d. Knight takes bishop, pawn takes knight, and bishop d3. This is the square the bishop belongs on. Again, not going to g2. Eyeing some squares over here on the eventual kingside position, and also keeping a watchful eye over c4, I believe, is important so that there can't be a, an annoying knight arriving on c4. Okay. So following up, we have e5. Black is opening the position, and black is the side that does not have the bishop pair. Why would you want to open a position when you don't have the bishop pair? Well, in this case here, black has a slight lead in development. Not sure how great the bishop pair is in this current position. 
and you might also reason that it's wise for black to open up the position because black will have the safer king with this f3 move g3 e3 a lot of pawn moves white will have the less secure king and maybe there's a a good way to exploit uh, the white king's position by opening up the center okay so following we have both sides castling queen b3 observes both b7 and keeps pressure on d5 queen to c8 was a move that took about 25 minutes to make more natural looking is queen c7 so when i saw queen c8 i tried to figure out the differences between these two squares queen c8 i believe is a move that avoids any potential tempo gaining moves against the queen tempo gaining moves in the form of a knight attack against the black queen or a dark square bishop attack point i'm getting at is if the queen is on c7 eventually there could be a knight that gets to b5 and a bishop that gets to f4 both would be attacking the queen and each of these highlighted squares b5 and f4 at this very moment seem a bit ridiculous but i believe it'll soon be a bit more clear by playing the queen to c8 we now have eventually or actually right away both queen knights repositioning to their ideal squares c3 and c6 so white hops to it knight b1 before black can do similar the tension needs to be released so first capturing after the recapture knight b8 knight c3 knight c6 and notice that if the black queen is on c7 at this point again there may be some ideas of knight b5 with an attack against the queen or bishop to f4 but with the queen on c8 that is simply avoided altogether okay bishop e3 lending support to d4 queen d7 both sides are by this 18th move now fully developed direct connection between both rooks rook a to d1 reinforcing d4 rook f to d8 rook f to e1 getting on an open file now black goes for a repositioning of the knight his uh square is eventually going to be the e6 point where it puts pressure on d4 also vacates f6 for a different piece the bishop where the bishop can converge on d4 but white is solid having enough defense on d4 at this point a little bit of a regrouping tucking in type of move next bishop f2 simply clearing the way for the rook knight c7 and now bishop to f1 another repositioning move allowing the rook to defend and there may even be ideas of bishop h3 placing the knight in a pin if he's going to e6 this right here i think is a very important point in the game um, what we eventually witness is a structure that ends up tipping in black's favor and uh, from that structure it's difficult for white to make good progress there's uh, a structure we arrive at where black is able to slowly make improving moves slight uh, piece repositioning and an advantage slowly but steadily starts to build um, there's an important move in this position and i believe it's related to f4 f4 was not played in this position instead it was bishop f1 bishop f6 queen a2 allowing the b pawn to advance and now g5 by black so now this f4 move cannot be played of course so easily not without wrecking the white king side structure this g5 move because white did not get this f4 move in himself with g5 played this will now allow black to improve even the king position by way of g6 
and king to g7, where the king is very well placed and much more secure than he is on the g8 square. Okay, um, so it's again at this point right here where after knight c7, the move f4 is maybe going to be a bit better. And let's say making a natural move if black was to follow up with rook a to c8, there can now be bishop f1, and one of the ideas behind f4, something I've yet to point out, not only to stop this expanding type of idea with g5 and g6, but to also clear this diagonal to add additional pressure to black's central point d5. This was, however, a structure that we did not get to see. White never played f4, and black had eventually clamped down with g5. Okay, so in the game it was on move 22, bishop f1, bishop f6, maybe even more accurate is to play g5 for black right now, because after bishop f1, bishop f6, this is yet again another opportunity to get in the f4 move. However, after queen a2, g5, black loses this option altogether. So, following up we have b4, g6. Queen d2, king g7. Queen d2 keeps pressure on g5, and there might even be some ideas of watching over the a5 square. Once this knight is kicked, if he's making use of a5, there might be some tactics with knight takes with the discovered attack against the knight. Okay, we don't get to see that. The knight is kicked. He doesn't choose to go to a5. Knight e7 instead is looking to... Still put pressure on d4 only from a different angle, the f5 square. The bishop e3 hits at g5 a second time. Knight e6 is a very convenient reply. Defense coupled with, still, an attack on d4. Bishop h3 pins the knight. Knight f5 breaks the pin on this knight here. And we have very good coordination with the black pieces all hitting at the d4 pawn. This bishop is also hit, and what are you going to do in this position as white? This knight is ready to take out the bishop on e3. If you're to avoid it with the bishop to f2, there could be queen d6 getting out of this pin. The queen is hitting the pawn, and, well, if you play a4, there's already knight takes like this, and black is up a pawn. So it's a difficult situation from this moment here. As soon as black replied to bishop h3 with knight f5, white has to give up their light square bishop. And after the recapture, well, we now have no longer the knight-bishop imbalance. There's no longer the bishop pair. Things are now pointing at uh, fixed pawns, the bishops, how well are they coordinated? Well, it's black who has the better coordination between pawns and bishop, having a good control over both dark and light squares, whereas the white pieces are now suffering soon on the light squares. In the game, we had f4. If f4 is not played, black may himself play f4. As an example, if queen d3 hitting this pawn... We could be having f4, grabbing some space. If there's this type of capture, there's maybe knight g5. Granting the knight access to light squares, the queen maybe coming into play, the rook coming over. So in order to stop black from maybe grabbing some kingside space, with f4 at some point, with maybe even the idea of um, luring the bishop away from defense of d4, um, black would be able to capture on d4 if the bishop is no longer on this diagonal. White simply stops that idea altogether. White stops black from playing f4 by move 30 by playing f4. Okay. As a follow-up, it was g4. And if we just look at the light squares in the white position, they are very weak, and all of these highlighted squares have very good support by black pawns. So what we can expect are pieces being placed on these squares. We get to see a couple of them occupied in the game, and in some lines there could even be the f3 square 
that can uh, be made use of. Uh, as I was reviewing for the game, there was an, an interesting knight move, some in-between move where the knight is able to play to f3 with check. But my main point here is that white is very weak on the light squares, and this bishop, it's hard to really call him a bishop at this point. He's just a, a tall pawn at this point. So, okay, g4, queen d3, puts pressure on f5. It's indirectly defended, since the rook has pressure on the knight. White defends. Rook c4, occupying a weak square in the white camp. More pressure on d4. White defends d4. Knight to c7, allowing the queen at this point to guard the f5 pawn. Knight c3. Rook to c8. And h3. At this point, white is trying to stir up some trouble. Any type of slow play at this point, well, white simply cannot afford slow play because black can do similar and uh, reposition the knight. The ideal home for this c7 knight would be e4. An absolutely fantastic square, well supported. As an example, if white is to go with a4, defending b5, there can follow knight e8, just kind of making a passing move. I don't know, king to, king to g2, let's just say. There's all of a sudden bishop to e7, and we're going to soon be having knight f6 to e4. He could be removed at some point, but notice that the pawn is always there to recapture, and there's still um, a great plus on the black side, having then a connected pass pawn. So slow play is not going to really be of any use to the white side. So he tries h3, pawn takes, king h2, knight takes b, knight takes, queen takes, king takes pawn, and now queen to d7, simply securing the light squares and ready to now reinforce this anchored rook on c4 by playing b5. Um, there's also ideas of queen to b2 with rook block and some tactics with rook takes d4, rook takes rook, rook takes queen, rook takes queen, bishop takes rook, bishop takes pawn, and at the end of this we have black, well, in a much more simplified position of course, and still being up material, two pawns in this case. We don't go in that direction. On this move 38 for black, it's not queen to b2, but rather queen d7, king g2, there's no rush at this point on the black side. b5 to secure the rook. Rook b1, a6. The rook shuffling back. It's tough to suggest anything for white at this point. Queen e6. Another idea for black would be rook c6 and queen to c8. Adding more pressure to the rook and looking to invade on white's second rank. But instead queen e6. Looking for a queen trade. Bishop f2, and now we have with this sequence now an imbalanced position, two rooks versus the queen. Black's position is so strong at this point, there's even ideas of queen to e4. Very cute move for this 42nd move. Queen e4 check. If rook takes, there's now d takes rook. If rook takes rook, pawn takes queen. And if rook takes rook d2, you can't stop the promotion. It's an interesting line on this 40-second move. You can actually play queen to e4 here. But instead it was rook takes rook, rook takes queen, pawn takes rook. And now g4, white has to stir up some trouble. We can be certain it won't be the bishop that's going to do anything dangerous to the king. There's just these pawns that are in his way. It's up to the queen and the g-pawn, really, with g4. White's trying to pry open this diagonal and this file to try and get the queen at the black king. And at this point, move 44, there was a really sharp move that black missed. The move played in the game was f takes g, but one strong move here, and I believe white would already be close to resigning.
the move here. If you'd like to, pause the video, see if you can figure it out on your own. The move played was bishop, or I'm sorry, the move that could have been played was bishop to h4. With the idea, if bishop takes bishop, in comes rook 8 to c3. c3 is being watched over, or I'm sorry, the third rank is being watched over, the first rank is being watched over, and well, where else is the queen going to go? e2, that runs into a pin and then win of the queen. So this would have been a very nice shot on this 44th move to play bishop h4. This would have been the best continuation for white, unfortunately, but they're now losing the queen again to this rook coming into the third rank, and then eventually with the pin and win of the queen. Okay, we didn't go in that direction. Bishop h4 was not played. Instead, f takes g. So black has to be a bit more careful. After queen e2, two points are being hit. King f7 defends. If queen takes pawn, there's rook g8 and the queen is won. So queen d3 looking to sneak in on h7. Rook c2. And now black has to dodge some checks here, but black is still winning. Even though it's a little bit more on the scary side. Bishop takes on d4. This bishop is now going to be won. Some checks are being thrown in, but the black king is simply running away. That bishop is picked up. There's just too much material on the black side now. King takes pawn. A couple checks are thrown in at this point to gain some time. We are playing with an increment, gaining 30 seconds per move. So Caruana was down to about two, two minutes around this point. King runs to c7. Queen check. King b6. Queen check. Rook blocks. Eventually these checks run out. And slowly but surely, black is having now everything coordinated. Everything is defended, in fact, after this 57th move. Bishop c5, king defends pawn, pawn defends pawn. Everything is simply glued together. And there's no way for the queen to uh, use any tactics. No forks in this position. These rooks are also there to watch out for the pawn. If he tries to get to f7, he'll be taken right out. So white still tries for a little bit more. Pushing f6, black grabs a pawn. These are now both, well, they're connected and passed. Another check. Back to being very coordinated. Another block. And once this position arrives, there's no checks against the black king here with this little uh, configuration of pieces. King to g5, rook c7, looking for a pin and win of the queen. King g6, this pawn gets rolling, queen to e6, bishop to d4, and, well, it is at this point that white resigns. This pawn is hit twice, it can't be defended, it's going to be one next. If it gets pushed, you're just winning that pawn. This is the point that Nakamura ends up throwing in the towel. If something like queen to d5 is tried, what would follow is rook takes pawn, King h5, we can have a couple checks thrown in. And after king to h5, one cool move, bishop to e3, and we're going to be having rook to h6 happening next. But as it was in this game, after bishop to d4, it is at this point again that Nakamura resigned. So that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye. And after d6 and the e5 pawn is defended, this means the knight on c6 is free to do other things, such as hunt down the bishop. White sees this, a3.